If you mention the word Atlantis to, to any archaeologist, they will tend to roll their eyes. The fittingly named Eye of the Sahara is by far the most likely location for the lost capital city of Atlantis. When you look at all of the areas around the planet that have been proposed for Atlantis, I think there's one place that fits the majority of his details, and that's the sunken Azores Plateau. The Reichat structure, often referred to as the Eye of the Sahara, is a remarkable and unique geological formation with some fascinating features. Spanning about 40 kilometers in diameter, it's so large that it can be easily spotted from space. The structure isn't a perfect circle, but rather takes on a slightly elliptical dome shape, adding to its mystique. One of the most striking aspects of the Reichat structure is its series of concentric rings. These rings are quite intriguing because they're not all the same. They vary in terms of their width, what they're made of, and how they've eroded over time. This creates a complex, layered look that's quite captivating. The rim rock of this is late Cretaceous, about 90 million years old. So at that point, it was below the ocean, right? Mm. So it's been uplifted. I think this thing is about 14 or 1500 feet above sea level. So it's been eroded. You see this whole thing here is like an erosion. The way these rings have formed is a tale of erosion at work. Over millions of years, forces of nature like wind and water have eroded the dome, unveiling these distinct rings. Each layer of the structure erodes differently, depending on how tough or soft it is, which is why we see this range of rings. Now let's talk about what the Rishat structure is made of, because it's quite a mix. The outer rings are primarily made of something called Proterozoic Quartzite. This is a very hard rock that's resistant to weathering, and it's incredibly old. We're talking over 600 million years. Quartzite forms from sandstone that's been put under a lot of heat and pressure, so it's been through a lot. As we move towards the inner rings, the story changes. Here we find softer, sedimentary rocks like limestone and sandstone. Limestone, primarily composed of calcium carbonate, typically forms in old marine environments. Sandstone, on the other hand, is made up of sand-like mineral particles. Right at the center, the Rishat structure has something called silicious breccia, which is basically a bunch of angular rock fragments stuck together. Breccia usually forms in areas with lots of volcanic activity, or where the Earth's crust has been moving and shaking. All these different rock types in one place make the Rechat structure quite special. Not only is it a visually stunning landmark, but it's also a valuable spot for geologists to study. So the connection to ancient Egypt that Solon draws and Plato passes on is actually very real. It's very, it's very solid. And I'm pleased to say that there has now been a full translation of the Edfu text. When it comes to how the Rishat structure was formed, there are a couple of theories floating around. The most widely accepted one is what geologists call the uplifted dome theory. In simple terms, this theory suggests that natural forces beneath the Earth's surface pushed up layers of rock, creating a sort of bulge on the surface. Over time, this dome was worn down by erosion, which is basically the wind and water gradually wearing away the rock. This erosion didn't happen uniformly, the softer rocks wore down faster than the harder ones, leading to the formation of those distinctive concentric rings we see today. Now, there's another, more speculative theory proposed by Jimmy Corsetti. He's got this interesting idea that the near-perfect circular shape and unique layering of the Rychat structure might not be all natural. He thinks that ancient human activities might have played a part in shaping it. The circular ring city was also said to have an opening to the sea at the south, which not only matches the southerly opening of the Rishat anomaly, but it even has existing evidence of a flow of salt water that is still visible to this day. The environment of the Sahara Desert has also played a significant role in the process of the Rychat structure formation. The dry, arid conditions mean that wind erosion is particularly influential in shaping the structure. And let's not forget that the Sahara hasn't always been a desert. It has gone through various climatic changes over millions of years, and these changes have influenced the rate and nature of erosion in the region. Some of the rocks there are incredibly old, dating back to over 600 million years ago. This period covers a huge chunk of our planet's past, from about 2.5 billion to 541 million years ago. It's a crucial era for understanding how continents formed and how early life evolved. Now, imagine the amount of time it took to form the Rechat structure, 
It's been shaped over millions and millions of years. A lot of factors played a role in shaping the reshut structure. Movements in the Earth's crust, like the shifting of tectonic plates, have been a big part of it. Then there's the impact of climate changes over the ages, especially in the Sahara region. All these changes influenced the patterns of erosion that gave the structure its current look. And speaking of erosion, it's been the main force sculpting and exposing the different layers of rock in the Reichat structure. One of the coolest things about the Rishat structure is its distinct circular pattern. As said before, it's so noticeable that astronauts use it as a landmark when they're up in space. This pattern really stands out against the surrounding desert landscape. If you take the concept of Atlantis seriously, you're regarded by archaeologists and their friends in the media as a kind of lunatic. And I've always found this odd because, because the source, the earliest surviving source for the tradition of Atlantis, is the highly respected figure of Plato. Plato's description of Atlantis, found in his dialogues Timaeus and Critias, really captures the imagination, doesn't it? Written around 360 BC, these works come from a time when Athens was at the height of its philosophical and cultural influence. Plato was a thinker who loved to dive deep into ideas about society, morality and reality, and he used these dialogues as a way to explore these themes. It's kind of like he was having a conversation through his characters which let him present different ideas and arguments. Now, about Atlantis itself, it's described as this massive island city located beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which most people think is the Strait of Gibraltar. Plato went all out in describing it as bigger than Libya and Asia combined, which really paints a picture of its mythical size. The city layout is fascinating, with these concentric circles of land and water. Imagine the engineering it would have taken to build something like that in ancient times, complete with canals and bridges connecting everything. The heart of the island, its central plain, was said to be super fertile, perfect for farming, and it was surrounded by high mountains rich in resources and natural protection. And Atlantis wasn't just about impressive landscapes, it was also a hub of resources and technology. Plato talks about it having all sorts of metals, including this mysterious orichalcum as well as gold and silver. The infrastructure was top-notch, with water systems, temples, palaces and docks. But Atlantis wasn't just about buildings and resources. Plato describes it as having a complex society with its own laws, customs and political organization. It even had a powerful military. Yet in his story, Atlantis starts as this ideal place and then becomes corrupt and ultimately falls. Plato includes precise scientific information in the story. And this is what archaeology is ignoring uh, when it says that it's all a fantastical made-up tale. And it, it's to do with that meltwater pulse 1b that I mentioned that, uh, that, that brought the Younger Dryas to an end 11,600 years ago and raised sea levels massively. Now let's talk about the theory connecting the Rishat structure, also known as the Eye of the Sahara, to the legendary city of Atlantis, as described by Plato. It's quite a fascinating topic, especially the ideas presented by Jimmy Corsetti. Here's where it gets interesting. Corsetti and some others have pointed out that these rings bear a striking resemblance to Plato's Atlantis, which in his dialogues Timaeus and Critias was described as having similar concentric circles of land and water. Now, while geologists understand these rings in the Rishat structure as a result of natural erosion processes, the similarity to the mythical Atlantis has sparked quite a bit of interest and speculation. When you compare the size of the Rishat structure to what Plato described for Atlantis, there seem to be some parallels, although there are notable differences in the exact measurements. Corsetti's theory even suggests that changes like erosion over time could have altered the Rishat structure's appearance, possibly bringing it closer to what Plato described. But here's a major twist in the tale. The Rishat structure is smack in the middle of the Sahara Desert, while Plato's Atlantis was described as an island in the Atlantic Ocean. This stark difference in geographical context has led to some interesting speculation. Some theorists propose that the landscape around the Rishat structure might have been very different in the past, possibly closer to water, or even more hospitable than the Sahara we know today. And he's shown writings on the walls by the priests. And he says, what do these writings say? And the priests then unravel the whole story of Atlantis, and they tell how there was this great advanced civilization, uh, which, uh, which at one time was, was extremely beneficial and positive to the world, but which fell out of harmony with the universe. 
The Eye of the Sahara is quite an archaeological goldmine. In this particular region, a variety of artifacts have been found, shedding light on the lives of people who lived there thousands of years ago. We're talking about stone tools like arrowheads, scrapers and axes that were probably used for hunting and crafting. These tools tell us a lot about the daily activities and skills of these ancient folks. Then there's the pottery. Finding fragments of pottery in the area is like getting a glimpse into their domestic life. It shows that they had developed pottery-making skills, which is a big deal in understanding the cultural and technological progress of any civilization. And you know what's even more intriguing? There are hints of more permanent forms of settlement. Although it's not definitive, the remnants of structures could mean that these were not just nomadic people passing through, but a community that settled down. But here's where it gets really interesting, the rock paintings and engravings. These are found on cliff faces and in caves right around the Rishat structure. The artwork is not just beautiful, it's like a storybook of ancient life. There are paintings of animals like antelopes, elephants and giraffes, suggesting a time when the Sahara was teeming with wildlife. Then there are human figures depicted in various activities, giving us a sneak peek into their social and cultural practices and the symbols and abstract designs might even point to their spiritual beliefs. Dating these rock arts can be tricky, but many are believed to be from the Neolithic period. This suggests that the region had a thriving community during that era. It's not just about finding old stuff, it's about piecing together the story of human habitation and development in the area. The presence of these artifacts and artworks indicates that there was a stable human population at some point, the possibility of permanent settlements, while not confirmed, is certainly tantalizing and calls for more extensive archaeological research. These findings are like puzzle pieces that help us understand the prehistoric Sahara, which was once a greener, more hospitable place than it is today. They tell a story of human adaptation and migration, of how people responded to the climatic changes that turned the Sahara into the desert we know now. It's not just about the history of a particular region, it's about adding to the rich tapestry of African prehistory and understanding the diversity and complexity of early human societies on the continent. Isn't it amazing how much we can learn about our past from the things left behind in the sands of time? Definitely a hall of records containing uh, a sort of time capsule from a forgotten episode in human history. What is concealed there touches on the fundamental mystery, the mystery of the immortality of the human soul. The concept of the Hall of Records is an intriguing blend of mysticism, archaeology, and speculative history, largely stemming from the visions of Edgar Case and the theories of Graham Hancock. Edgar Case, known as the Sleeping Prophet, was an American clairvoyant who claimed to access a wealth of knowledge in a subconscious state. During his trance-like states, Casey spoke of a Hall of Records, a repository containing the wisdom and history of a long-lost civilization believed to be Atlantis. This mythical island nation, famously mentioned in Plato's dialogues, was, according to Casey, a hub of advanced technology and spiritual knowledge. Casey had no apology for the limits of his psychic ability, though he continued to make world predictions he never considered himself a prophet. Casey's visions placed one of these halls beneath the Sphinx in Egypt, suggesting it held records from Atlantis, including cosmic knowledge and advanced technologies. He also mentioned two other locations, one underwater near the Bahamas and another in the Yucatan region, linked to the ancient Maya. His description of Atlantis painted it as an advanced civilization, aware of its impending doom, who created these halls to preserve their knowledge for posterity. Enter Graham Hancock, a writer known for his alternative historical narratives. Hancock has been deeply interested in the Hall of Records, seeing its potential discovery as supporting evidence for his theories of a prehistoric advanced civilization. I think the key thing is we're, we're looking at technologies that are not the same as ours. Yes. And that's yes, partly that's why point. archaeologists can't see them, because they're looking for us in the past, and they're not open to the possibility that there are whole other kinds of technology that could be used. He believes this civilization existed during the last Ice Age and was lost to a global cataclysm. For Hancock, the Hall of Records isn't just a mythical concept, but could be a real repository of lost knowledge. He speculates that it might contain detailed astronomical data and advanced technologies that could challenge our understanding of ancient civilizations. Hancock's theories suggest that such a discovery could bridge the gap between myth and historical fact. 
providing tangible proof of a once globally influential civilization with profound knowledge in astronomy and architecture. We're looking at the clues that lead to specific locations. That shaft which led to that doorway was always a clue. The opening of that shaft was sealed until 1872. The last five inches of stone over the mouth of that shaft had been left deliberately in place. Now moving on, the discovery of the sunken city of Thonis Heracleion off the coast of Egypt has been a remarkable window into the past, unveiling a wealth of information about the ancient world. Located strategically near the canopic mouth of the Nile, north of Abukir Bay, Thonis Heracleion was a pivotal maritime hub. Its position was crucial for navigation and commerce, bridging the Nile River with the vast Mediterranean Sea. The city, with its natural harbour shielded by a chain of islands, thrived as a major port, a testament to its urban and architectural prowess as indicated by the remnants of a network of canals, docks and temple complexes. Rediscovered in the early 2000s, Thonis Heracleion had been submerged and lost for centuries before French underwater archaeologist Frank Godio and his team, employing advanced techniques like sonar scanning, brought it back to light. This monumental discovery, made in collaboration with the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, ensured that the findings were well documented and preserved. The utilization of cutting-edge technology in underwater archaeology has been pivotal in mapping the city's layout and recovering artifacts, offering us a clearer picture of its past. Dating back to at least the 12th century BC, Thonis Heracleion was more than just a city. It was a bustling hub during its heyday in the late Pharaonic and early Greco-Roman periods. As a significant commercial center, it played an integral role in the Mediterranean trade network, dealing in goods like grain, papyrus, precious metals and spices. But its significance wasn't limited to trade alone. The city was a cultural melting pot, blending Egyptian, Greek and Roman cultures. This amalgamation was reflected in the diverse range of artifacts unearthed, including statues and inscriptions, showcasing various artistic styles and cultural influences. The city's religious significance cannot be overstated. With its large temples and sanctuaries dedicated to numerous Egyptian gods and goddesses, Thonis Heracleion was a spiritual beacon, especially known for hosting the annual Mysteries of Osiris rituals. Politically, too, it was a powerhouse, serving as a primary entry point for foreign diplomats and traders to Egypt, and playing a crucial role in international relations. Its administrative significance was also marked, given its role in tax collection and governance. The Society for American Archaeologists claimed that they could absolutely for certain be sure that there was no lost civilization during the Ice Age. They knew it was a fact, and if there had been any civilization, they would have found it, right. and they would have published it. The archaeological treasures unearthed from the sunken city of Thonis Heracleion have been absolutely incredible each offering a unique glimpse into the life and times of this ancient Egyptian city. For starters, the discovery of over 64 ancient shipwrecks is remarkable. It's not just the number that's impressive, but also their state of preservation. These wrecks are like time capsules, giving us a real sense of the maritime activities that once buzzed in this port. They tell us about the shipbuilding techniques of the era, how these vessels were designed, constructed, and the materials used. The diversity of ships, from grand cargo vessels to smaller boats, paints a picture of a bustling harbour engaged in a wide range of maritime endeavours, and the cargo remnants, including amphorae and various trade goods, speak volumes about Thonis Heracleion's extensive trade network. Then, there are the anchors, about 700 of them. This is unheard of in underwater archaeology and speaks to the sheer scale of the port's operations. The size and design of some of these anchors suggest they were used by large, heavy ships, showcasing the port's capacity and technological prowess at the time. The materials used, stone, metal, reflect not just the resources available but also the level of craftsmanship and maritime technology of the period. The statues they found are simply awe-inspiring. Imagine coming face to face with a 16-foot tall statue underwater. These statues, representing gods, goddesses, pharaohs, and perhaps significant city figures, give us a window into the religious and political life of Thonis Heracleion. Made from granite and diorite, they're not just huge, they're also beautifully crafted, a testament to the city's wealth and its cultural significance. Gold coins are another major find. The substantial quantity of coins discovered indicates the city's economic prosperity. 
These coins span across various eras and rulers, providing a timeline of the city's prominence and its connections in trade. They're solid proof of Thonis Heraclean's active role in regional and international trade networks. There are, you have to be careful when you look at underwater structures. You have to look at all the conditions that have led to their submergence. And, and in some cases, it's very clear that they've been underwater for a very, very, very long time indeed. Thonis Heraclean is like a treasure trove for anyone fascinated by ancient civilizations. The way this city was laid out tells us so much about the people who lived there and their advanced understanding of urban planning. They had a network of canals, roads and buildings, all systematically arranged, which is pretty impressive when you think about how old this city is. These canals were crucial for transport and trade, functioning like water-based roadways. It's amazing to imagine boats navigating these waterways as part of daily life in the city. Then there's the city's architecture, particularly its temples. Thonis Heraclean wasn't just a trading hub, it was a religious center too. The temples there were dedicated to various deities like Amun and Heracles, showcasing the religious diversity of the time. These weren't just simple structures, they were architecturally grand with large columns, statues and intricate carvings. It's fascinating to think about how these temples were not only places of worship, but also centers for social and cultural activities. They played a significant role in the daily life of the city. The city's role as a cultural hub is further highlighted by the artifacts found there, which show a blend of Egyptian, Greek and Roman influences. I think we're looking at something from Alexandria here. Yes. Yeah, we are. We are. I've dived there as well. That's inundated not because of sea level rise, but because of subsidence of the Nile silts. Uh, Moving on to more underwater locations in Egypt, Cleopatra's palace in Alexandria is truly a fascinating subject, especially when you dive into its location, historical context, and the treasures it held. Nestled in the eastern harbor of Alexandria, the palace was not just any royal residence. It was located in the most prestigious part of the city, known as the Royal Quarter. This was where the heart of political and cultural activity in the Ptolemaic period beat the strongest. Now think about Cleopatra Sevevan, the figure to whom this palace belonged. She was the last pharaoh of the Ptolemaic kingdom, renowned for her intelligence, charisma and her liaisons with figures like Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. The palace, from its architecture to its contents, was a reflection of her power and prestige. Imagine a grand structure combining traditional Egyptian and Hellenistic architectural elements with lavish decorations and intricate detailing. It wasn't just a place to live, it was a statement of power and culture. The palace was probably filled with lush gardens and courtyards, offering a peaceful retreat in the midst of a bustling city. And given Alexandria's reputation as a center of learning and scholarship, it wouldn't be surprising if Cleopatra's palace housed extensive libraries and study areas. This would have been a place where the intellectual elite of the period gathered. The grand reception halls in the palace would have been venues for diplomatic events and political discussions, playing a crucial role in the international politics of the era. The artifacts and architectural elements discovered from this palace are like pieces of a historical puzzle. Statues, possibly depicting Cleopatra, Ptolemaic rulers and Egyptian gods, made from materials like granite and basalt, give us a glimpse into the artistic excellence of the time. The columns and other architectural fragments found at the site tell a story of opulence and artistic fusion, where Greek and Roman influences blended with Egyptian motifs. And then there are the sphinxes, symbolizing royal power and religious significance, perfectly illustrating the cultural synthesis that was characteristic of the Ptolemaic period. These discoveries are not just about Cleopatra's personal tastes. They provide a deeper understanding of the Ptolemaic society during her reign. The blend of Egyptian, Greek and Roman elements found in the palace's architecture and artifacts reflects the rich cultural diversity and exchange that occurred under Cleopatra's rule.